Certainly. Lovely. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Alberto Costa. I'm of Scottish Italian background and I'm standing before you as a Conservative Party candidate. This election isn't about me or Amanda or any of the candidates that you see before you. It's about all of you and your country. It's about your future. And my party, the Conservative Party, is the party of aspiration. And what I hope to do if I'm elected as your new MP is bring forth policies specifically designed for all of you to ensure that you've got the opportunities to have a happy and successful life. I'm really proud to be representing the Labour Party um, for, the, the, for the election um, for South Estyshire MP. Um, I joined the Labour Party when I was about 14 years of age, and the reason I joined the party is, was clearly for social, it was about social justice. I believe that the Labour Party can change um, the fabric of the UK by increasing uh, levels of inequality across, across our country. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, my name is Zuffa Hack, I represent the Liberal Democrats. Um, born here locally in Leicester, passionate about improving life for people in, in the Leicestershire area. Uh, as regards to me joining the Liberal Democrats, I strongly believe in equality, liberty and freedom. And the fact that the Liberal Democrats offer equality to all people from all backgrounds, all race, creed, colour, se sexual orientation, was what attracted me to the party. Thank you. Hello, hi, my name is Mohammed Ahmed, um, part of um, Trade Union Socialist Coalition Party. The reason why I joined them was because of a lot of stuff, uh, one just as people's voices are being lost and not being heard, and that is the main reason why I joined this particular um, party, to make sure people's voices are heard, like your voices. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I'm Barry Mahoney, I'm standing for the UK Independence Party, and I joined the party uh, 20 years ago because we believe that the best people to govern Britain are the British, not an unelected commission in Brussels. And currently, 75% of our laws are just nodded through straight from Brussels, which is why we uh, keep having changes of government without changes of policy. And so that's really why I'm there, and so we can take control back of our country and uh, run it for the benefit of Britain, all of Britain and all Britons. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, the Labour Party was founded in 1900 and it was, um, it was the party that was to try and represent the workers of the UK. And it was a really important time um, in UK history. <coughs> We've been pushed, we've, we've actually, um, the cornerstone of our party is about equality and social justice, as I've said already. And we've been pushing the boundaries for both of those things for some time. And the Labour movement has seen the increase of particular female MPs um, in, the, in our party is at 33%. And Ed Miliband has already said that his cabinet would have a 50-50 split between men and women. And I think that's an important step forward for equality in our country. I believe in this message, and the previous Labour government did many things to address inequality in our society. The introduction of the minimum wage was land, uh, land shift um, policy, but we need to, need to move that on again. We changed the law which paved the way for equal marriage for all individuals, regardless of sexuality. We made whole so sweeping changes in employment legislation. The introduction of tax credits actually reduced child poverty by a long way. Uh, unfortunately, child poverty has been on the increase recently. And more, more young people than ever before went to university. Our aim for the next government, if elected, will be to change UK society and make sure we can push it on again with the equality agenda. Okay, thanks Amanda for that. Mr. Paul? Yeah, um we stand for equality, social justice, um, freedom, and the opportunity to give everybody the best start in life. The Liberal Democrats, while they've been in government, they've managed to deliver free school meals for children. They've pushed on people premium so that more people uh, who need help in those early years will actually be getting it. It's a targeted way of aiding children in particular to meet their maximum potential. The 
the, the main thing is that the liberal democrats, liberal liberalism is about equality and freedom for people and making sure they reach their maximum potential in life. And all the aims that we try and do and deliver on is trying to make sure and ensure that happens for people. Not just for the people on the right of, of politics, not just for the people on the left, but somewhere in the middle. And I'm very comfortable with actually being in that middle area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm from Trade Union, so it's good party. I have recently um, joined a bar as part of the party for about four months. So don't expect me to know that much about the party, however, I'll tell you what I know about the party and the reason why I joined and the reason why I think that certain young people would benefit this type of um, party. Reason being is that the main reason I joined was because I was involved with the youth council and the council where I saw a lot of the youth services being cut, a lot, um, a lot, a lot of drastic cuts. But not just within the youth services, other services like the housing services, the um, economic department, different departments. And the reason why I joined this party is because they want to stand up against qu uh, cutting quality services. And the other thing is, with this particular party, is that they want to ra raise the minimum wage and as well as stop the zero hours contract. They want to raise the minimum wage up to £10 an hour. And that would benefit a lot. To raise the minimum wage up to £10 an hour, which will also increase the jobs that are available there, at the same time you still have enough money to survive, to have a house, to run, pay off the bills and everything. With right now, the minimum wage of 21 is £6.50. Me personally, I don't find that enough to survive on. So therefore, I have to live with my parents, as you probably can guess. So that's one of the main reasons why I joined this particular party. The other reason is because they are against racism, fascism, and against Islamophobia, and against stereotyping transgenders or different sexuality. We all for everyone and we represent everyone, no matter what creed or religion we are from. Okay, thank you for that. And Barry? <coughs> all right, well, almost the same answer as I started off with, what makes your party different? It's to re-establish independence of the United Kingdom from the European Union. When we were first of all put into this European Union, it was at the time called the European Economic Community, and we were told, oh, it's only about trade. There's no political union at all. And the Prime Minister at the time, Edward Heath, was told by the Attorney General, but of course you are going to lose sovereignty, you will not be able to control your own uh, laws. And he turned around and he lied to the British <coughs> people and said, of course there is no threat to sovereignty. Well, over time, the European <coughs> Economic Community uh, became the European uh, U uh, Union, uh, became the European Community, then became the European Union. And in 1991, uh, the trap finally shut uh, and we ended up with a European Parliament which will override uh, the our Parliament in Westminster. And uh, European law now overrides English law. And don't ever forget that, because that means that we no long second half of the question was how would you describe your aim and values? Well, clearly on withdrawal from the European Union, we can get back control <coughs> over our borders. <coughs> and our policies, our values are generally what you would call uh, common sense, uh, fair play, pragmatism, and those essential qualities that are enshrined in English law, that is, <coughs> the presumption of innocence, uh, the uh, trial by jury of your peers, and the uh, rule of habeas corpus, that means no, bring me the body, you cannot be held in prison without being charged. And these are things that are precious. And in the eight, by chance, in the 800th year of, uh, 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 what was it, 1215? Magna, Magna Carta, thank you. And in the 800th year of Magna Carta, when the rule of law was established, this does seem quite, uh, uh, quite appropriate. Thank you, Barry, for that very much. And final.
answer this question, Alberta, please. Well, Harry, firstly, thank you for that excellent question. This is a democracy, and the big difference between the Conservative Party and the other parties represented here today is simply this. As I said at the outset, it's not about me or the candidates, it's about you. My party, at its core, believes in freedom under the rule of law. In other words, it believes in a country where you as citizens have the right to lead your life as you want to have it. And that includes how you want to have your partnership. We've heard the word equality mentioned a number of times. It was a Conservative Prime Minister that brought in gay marriage, not a Labour Prime Minister or a Liberal Democrat. But we don't beat our chests and use these words because we leave it for you to decide how you want to live your life. If you want to open up a business, if you want to work in the public sector or the private sector or for a charity, it's up to you whether you want to stay in this country or move abroad. So at its core, the value system of the Conservative Party is freedom under the rule of law. So I would encourage you to listen to what the other parties have to say, but always remember at heart that we, the Conservative Party, represent a party of choice. And that's what we give to the electorate, a choice as to how you want to live your life. Thank you for that. Nice platform to start on. Yes, I would. Um, you can join the army at 16. You can get married at 16 with your parents' consent. Um, why shouldn't people be able to vote at the age of 16? And I think it makes common sense and get more engagement from younger people in politics. Because whether we like it or not, our lives do revolve around decisions made in Westminster and other parts of, of, the, uh, of, of the, the country. So we need to be actively involved in what's happening. And if that starts at a younger age and people uh, are allowed to vote at 16, I think we'll make a better country. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, well, simply, yes, um, we believe in that voting at 16 is a key thing for young people to engage in democratic and political. Um, the reason being is, it doesn't matter if you come to a public school or if you're going to a school across the road or if you find the work. Wherever that happens with that particular people that 18 plus chooses, that's how it's going to affect your life. Whether they choose for a UK, <coughs> whatever the UK stands for, I'm not sure exactly what the UK exactly stands for. Well, but um, <laughs> same as the um, Labour, Labour, it doesn't matter what party you choose for, it is important for you to voice your opinion. Because whatever you voice your opinion has to be, is, is what they take on to the parliament. Sorry, I'm not normally used to speaking to this much. But <laughs> and the other thing is, if you can get married at the age of 16 or rent a house at the age of 16, or start to learn how to drive by the age of 16, why should you not be voting? Thank you. Barry, now tell us what you think. <laughs> right. I mean, the, I have found no great uh, urgency to lower the voting age. Uh, and uh, although I wouldn't oppose it, uh, I don't, on the other hand, see any great urgency. It was brought in in Scotland, by the way, because the Scots Nats Party thought that would swing the election. And the same thing happened in England uh, when the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18. The uh, Labour Party brought it in because they thought it would swing the election of that year. And it didn't. And the reason is, is that the participation rate of younger people uh, tends to be much lower than of older people. Well, uh, that's why it didn't work. Now, is that a reason not to lower the voting age, well, no it isn't. It's just that I see at the moment that there's no great uh, will for it and it could well be a distraction. Uh, and that's where I stand. <coughs> Alberta, your thoughts on that please? Well, the Conservative Party is what we call a broad church. There are Conservatives that believe in lowering the voting age to 16 and there are those that don't believe in lowering the age to 16. The Scottish Conservative leader persuaded the Prime Minister, David Cameron, just three months ago to give the power to the Scottish Parliament to lower the age if they want to do so for the 2016 elections. So I pledge this, if I'm elected as your new MP for South Leicestershire, I'll be taking on board the views of all the constituents here, the younger people, and I will then form a decision as to whether or not going forward in future elections we should do what will be happening in Scotland, which is to lower 
the age for Westminster. But I want to listen to you first before I make a decision on that matter. Commander. I think the, I mean, I think the answer, that simple answer is yes. Um, and we've gone further. We've already identified that the legislation is waiting, ready to go, if, we, if the um, Labour government are, are elected in May. Um, 16 and 70 year olds will have the right to vote from May 16, which means for, for you here, um, you will be able to vote in the county elections in, two, in 2017. That is a, that is a clear um, opportunity for, for yourselves. We also want to shake up voter registration, and I think it's really important. We've already heard from Barry about um, the reason why maybe it's not important is, is young people don't vote. Well, that's probably the reason why it's important, because young people don't vote. I think it's really important that there isn't a disconnect between leaving, potentially leaving at school at 16 and then being able to vote at 18. You've, you've lost um, the, the ability to connect with young people. We want to go. We want to make it easier to vote, which will include block registration um, on universities. We will be trying to make it, um, trying to look at trying new ways of voting. So online voting. We know there'll be there'll be lots and lots of trouble and problems delivering that. We're going to trial it. I think it's really important to look at new ways of engaging with with not just young people but across all voters, and we have to give that opportunity to all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I was born in Sweden. I wasn't necessarily born in the UK. One of the things I have noticed with uh, immigration, immigration is definitely increasing. But one of the things you might want to look at into perspective is the, fa the fact that there is a lot of jobs, um, that unskilled jobs that a lot of people who are necessarily born in the United Kingdom don't want. They want uh, skilled prof um, jobs, professional jobs. So one of the things that are unskilled jobs that I probably would consider is, um, you probably know about... Uh, Warehouse, like picking up and putting stuff onto a shelf. Would you actually do that? A lot of the people who are coming from abroad would actually do that because they still see that as a job and they still see as a, some source of income. Immigration, in terms of the immigration, I know the European Union isn't perfect. I'm not saying it, it, it will be perfect. What I'm saying is the European Union does definitely need some sort of reform and some sort of um, change. Um, originally, um, the United Kingdom has joined the European Union without not consulting the young people, without not consulting the people that live in the United Kingdom. No matter if they're from Sweden or something, if they have the right to live in the UK, they haven't even been consulted. So in my opinion, if there would have um, been a referendum, I would I wouldn't say yes or no. With socialism, um, there's different types of strength uh, with socialism as we um, the conservative have different um, roles, as you said, churches, if I recall it right. Um, so yeah, in terms of in back <coughs> immigration, in terms of immigration, immigration isn't perfect, and it needs to be made perfect. I will not stop people still coming to the United Kingdom. That's the bottom line, because we're not a racist organization, we're not a fascist organization, and we're not against any creed, no matter where you're from. If we believe that you've got the right to come to the UK, you'll come under the UK, under the human rights article. Um, one of the things I want to mention is that the fact that if we withdraw from the European Union, it means that we might have to withdraw from the human rights um, law, which obviously then will allow anything. And that particularly links back to immigration, because a lot of immigration stuff. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks, Nahan, for that one. And Barry, your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, the, the, the reason why immigration is so important is because it affects just about everything else. It affects wage levels, it affects unemployment and employment, uh, it affects housing, it affects social cohesion, and for a country such as this, which is overpopulated, the classic definition being, can you feed yourself, and it has been overpopulated for many years. Now, for years, we used to talk about uh, the the problem with the European Union is that it overrode English law uh, and it cost the fortune, this famous £55 million pounds a day, and uh, that it weakened uh, the UK's voice on various uh, international committees, and then the World Trade Organization is one. And it went on for years, and this whole thing about English law is overruled by European law. It went over people's heads. And then about five years ago, uh, 
the Prime Minister left his microphone on when he spoke to a woman called Gillian Duffy, and she was worried that her grandchildren could not pay off their education debts, they couldn't get a job, and that the local housing in their village was being taken by Eastern Europeans and not reserved for local people. And the Prime Minister at the day, uh, Gordon Brown, said that woman is a bigot. That woman is a bigot because she, she is worried about her children, uh, her grandchildren, not having jobs and uh, not being able to get hold of housing. And this is why this whole area of uncontrolled people movement uh, is, is essential. It all sounds great, doesn't it? The free movement of people. It's about freedom. It's about movement. It's about people. Well, how could anybody uh, object to that? The problem is, when you have uncontrolled population movements, how do you plan for education, for housing, for roads, for to, uh, in, turn, in times when there's political um, and economic hardship, how do you uh, then restrict uh, inward movements of people who will only then increase unemployment? It's not their fault. Uh, uh, I've worked with Eastern Europeans, and they've got a very good work ethic. And you can understand why employers don't employ 16, 17, 18-year-old school leavers in, e in England or in Britain <coughs> and will employ a 22, 23-year-old Eastern European. Okay, Mary, thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do the young people get their work experience? Thank you. Alberta, your view on that? I'm going to stand up to rebut everything uh, we've just heard from the UK candidate. Sam, thank you for your question. I'm the son of an immigrant, and I think that UK are studying it, and we all have a duty in this hall to say no to UK and the policies that it espouses. <laughs> and I hope you all agree with that. But immigration is an issue for some people on the doorstep. I do go around the doors here in South Leicestershire, and I'm sure Amanda will also agree with me that we do hear immigration being an issue. That where Barry and his party have got it terribly wrong is immigrants aren't the cause of problems, it's the economy. Immigrants come to this country because we're one of the wealthiest countries and most stable countries on earth. And we should be very proud of that. Immigration has brought an enormous amount of success into the United Kingdom. Last week I had lunch with Boris Johnson and he was singing the praises of immigration into the United Kingdom. But yes, we have to tackle the issue that we hear on the doorstep. And what my party has done in government is two things. Number one, for people wanting to come into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland from outside the EEA, that's the European Union and some other uh, European countries, what we've done is we've lowered it. We want the best talent to come into the United Kingdom. And we also, as a rich country, will accept a fair number of people who are coming as refugees. I think it's right as a civilised society that we should do that. But it's also right that we have a controlled and fair system, which is what we have brought <coughs> in government. And that differentiates us from what the Labour Party did over 13 years. As to, as to the EU, that's the next question. But the freedom of movement of people is not unqualified. When you want to go to France or Italy, you've got to show your passport. We're not mem members of Schengen. And so when the Prime Minister says that he will be able to renegotiate some of the terms of the Treaty of Rome, I believe that he'll be able to do that and bring forth a fair and open system that we can all be happy at when it comes to immigration. Thank you, Alberto. Nothing like immigration to get the passion running. <laughs> and we'll hear from our Labour candidate. Amanda. So, so obviously the question, the question was why, why is it important? Well, the, the electorate tells us it's important. We have to respond to the, 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 the elected, uh, the, the, the public that, that votes us in. Um, we have to have a debate about immigration, and I think it's right and important to do so. But we have to recognise the positive impact migration has, had on the, uh, has on the UK economy. In my day job, I manage a hospital um, accommodation for hospital and um, that hospital has actively had to go into the European <coughs> Union to seek do uh, doctors and nurses um, because we don't have enough nursing staff in that particular part of the UK um, but they're doing, a, doing that alongside training nurses from their local population 
So we have to look at skill shortages that we've got in the UK and look at ways in which we address that. And the immigration has been one way of dealing with it. But we've got some clear policies to try and tackle immigration in the UK. We want to um, uh, reintroduce the count in, the count out of people coming into the, into the UK. It's important to know who's here. It's important to know who, who's leaving the UK. We, we want to make it a, an offence to exploit workers from wherever they're from, whether that's a, a British worker or a European worker. That, that, would, that would also provide support. One of the critical things, though, I think, is, is looking at how organisations, um, recruitment agencies, actively go into Europe to recruit. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong that uh, Next opened a depot in the north of England and actually advertised in Poland a week before they advertised to the British public. Those kind of things have to stop. We want to ensure that large employers who actually go outside the EU to bring in skilled talent, reflect, make sure they've got commitment to train British talent through, the, through apprenticeship. But we also recognise the need to ensure that public sector workers in outwardly facing roles have to have a minimum standards of, of English. Okay, well, come on there, yeah. Well, the, the one thing I just wanted to... to okay, to one more on, point then. Okay. I think it's really important to draw this distinction when we talk about immigration between the different groups of, 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 of individuals. The UK does, as, as Alberto has already said, the UK has a role in refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and I, didn't, I definitely think that the individuals who are seeking asylum in this country need that support and help. Thank you for that. And Zafar? Yeah, uh, Sam, thank you very much for your question. Um, I actually quite feel quite sad that we're actually in this era now talking about immigration, but sadly it is a, an impact on the doorstep. People are talking about immigration. Um, in the Liberal Democrat Manifesto back in 2005, 2010, uh, there was a clear commitment to make sure that we have border security checks. We know who's going out of the country, and we know who's coming back into the country. Um, I'm obviously brought up in Leicester, my, my grandfather was the first immigrant, came in to Leicester in 1919. And during the 20, 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, they were, he, we were probably the only family in Leicestershire who were from the a Asian background. And my father certainly said that when he walked down the street, people would come to him and say to him, come and have tea with us, come and have dinner with us. We want to learn what India is like. And he, he, he loved this country with a huge passion because he thought it was great. And he, he loved the people, and he loved the country. Now, for me, immigration has gone, has gone out of order, and has been for the last 10 years. And, and the system allowed too many people to come in from Europe and claim social security and claim benefits. Germany has recently put a, 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 a law in place that nobody coming into Germany will be able to claim benefits something like six months or two a year. And that's what should happen in the UK. So if anybody comes from Europe, unless they've got a job, they're not allowed to claim social security benefits. Like that should enable the UK to establish itself and only genuine people who have got a job to come here and work. Emigration is hugely, hugely positive and can bring a country uh, huge prosperity. <coughs> and we should never, ever forget that. There is a huge amount of people in the NHS, doctors, nurses, not just thousands, but tens of thousands working in the UK, providing life-saving care to people in this country. And immigration is hugely, hugely positive. It makes a better country, a better society, and a better lifestyle. Okay, thank you very much for those answers. And We've had extremism before in this country uh, for about 30 years, throughout the 1970s, 80s and 90s, and we never, and only then, a terrorist was somebody who was part of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and nobody made the mistake of thinking that all Irish people were supporting extremists. And the most important thing to understand is that ISIS uh, is not representative of all Muslims. Now, one of our Muslim uh, members of UKIP explained it to me, and he'd been uh, 20 years serving in the Royal Navy, 
And he was saying that 40 years ago, uh, Muslims coming to Britain were largely uh, uh, what you would call liberal, uh, uh, well-educated or open-minded. They weren't extremists and they were used to living in a country where you could have uh, religious freedom and you could uh, privately follow your own religion and there was no problem. Uh, but again, and that the risk of just touching on uncontrolled immigration and uncontrolled borders, what has happened in recent times has been a, a large influx of people who have not had such an open world view. Uh, and in particular, there is, an, uh, 10 years ago, one of our MEPs, Gerard Batten, uh, actually published the, the threat from a very extremist sect within uh, Islam called creating a lot of problems, particularly in Saudi Arabia and for the Saudi Arabians themselves. And the one thing that you, you should remember is that these extremists, first of all, persecute those who are nearest to them. And we saw this in you know, the Soviet Union, the KGB. Uh, first of all, the uh, oppressed Russians and in Nazi Germany, the first victims were Germans, the first victims of ISIS and these very extremists are other Muslims who have uh, uh, adapted to living in the West. So that is the first thing. We have not helped, when I say we, Britain has not helped this position by its constant interference in the Middle East. Ten years ago I was at a similar uh, debate with a, another college about 30 miles from here and the hot topic at the time then was the Iraq war and Afghanistan war. And you do not win hearts and minds by dropping bombs on people. And then since then, of course, it's gone into Syria and bombing Libya. And if you think that you're going to win friends in the Middle East, and because half this question was about conflicts in the Middle East, that is not the way to do it. Thank you, Barry, for that. Thank you. Uh, and Alberta, tell us how the Conservatives are approaching this. I think there's three ways to tackle this, this question, Josh. I think firstly, education. We need to fight a horrible idea with a better idea. We've got to reinvigorate ourselves on what we mean by Western values and why we think Western values are superior to the values of extreme organisations like ISIS. I think the second way that we need to do so is through strengthening our military resolve. It's not just ISIS, there are other extremist groups who may or may not be uh, affiliated with any religious faith, but we've got to re-strengthen uh, our military forces. We need to spend uh, at least 2% of our GDP to match funding that's required to strengthen NATO, to ensure that NATO has the <coughs> adequate uh, resources at hand to deal with these types of threats. But the third thing that we need to do also is before we go into any war in future, we need to understand what is in the best interests of the United Kingdom. Is it in the best interest to wage war against a nation that has in effect a civil war? Or is it in our best interests not to do so? I think those three things, Josh, I would say is what the Conservative Party do in terms of going forward. So we are establishing better cultural and education links with areas within the United Kingdom where we think there is an, a threat in the country but we're also concerned about our military resources and intend to spend more in beefing up our defence. Can I just confirm something now, Bertie? Are you saying then that if the Conservatives are re-elected, that they will spend 2% of our GDP on armed forces? I can say that as Conservatives in this government, we have done that. We've matched 2%. Will you do and that in the future? We're going to have a defence review, and that will then determine exactly how much money we spend going forward. But we have done it in government, <coughs> this parliament. Amanda. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, obviously the UK has got a role to play, uh, and we've got amongst others in the Western world. We have to respond to the threat of extremism. 
The reason why I think this is such a tough question is because the, 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 the issues are quite delicate and they're all very different. So we have to think of ways in which we can support the region in different ways and each country, each, each issue will, will need a different solution. But I'm supportive of the UK and its current endeavours in the region and um, particularly the work that we're doing to support Iraqis <coughs> to ensure that they can um, respond to the threat of, of ISIL in their own country. Uh, and we've heard the news overnight that the, the Iraqi forces are winning an argument in one of their key cities, and that, that's happening now as we speak. We have to empower Iraq to take back um, power of their own country. It's not necessarily about us always intervening with military intervention. The situation in Syria, though, is quite different, um, and the, the, the whole of Parliament <coughs> debated Syria uh, last summer when it was starting to become, get it towards its peak. Um, the Parliament was brought back, and the decision was taken that military uh, intervention wouldn't uh, be taken forward. At the moment, the UK, I think, is, is on a, a watch uh, to see how this, this continues to develop. Although I think we need to look at what we're doing in our own country. And we've long, long been advocates of the PREVENT programme, which is where we're trying to prevent extremism from within British citizens. We've long called for the overhaul of the government's um, anti-counter-terrorism programme, that where parents, families, neighbours, mosques, friends are all in the first line of defence against extremism. We have to tackle and de-radicalise any British fighters um, that go over to, to fight with, with ISIL. Um, and we need that cooperation across the, the European Union to ensure we have a consistent response across the whole of Europe. Okay, thank you, Amanda, for that. And Zafar, for you? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much for the question. Um, what I want to say is actually that this is a major, major problem. And the way to deal with it is not just by targeting the community and saying we need to deal with it, the community needs it. There's a whole issue behind the scenes. The reason why I got involved in politics was because of the Iraq war. When I wrote to my Tory MP at the time, he wrote back to me and said, we have seen all the evidence, we are convinced there's weapons of mass destruction and we're going to go into Iraq and regime changes are end goal Effectively, that's what happened, regime, regime change of Saddam Hussein. And have we really dealt with that problem? We're almost 15 years on from then, and the problem is still there. I still will still be there in a, about another five or ten years, most analysts are telling us. They will still be there. This battle will go on for the rest of our lifetimes, maybe. Uh, and, and that's scary. We've got to look at foreign policy decisions. We've got to support those countries in the Middle East support those countries to deal with ISIS. We don't go in ourselves. We support the countries. We win hearts and minds. It's about people. People are suffering across, across the board. There, there, there was, I think, a million casualties in Syria. Some of them men, women, children. And it's totally unacceptable. But we've got to let those countries in that area and support them and to help deal with them. To put boots on the ground or, or, or more military action has, didn't solve the problem in the first place. It's not going to solve the problem now. So we have to remember that for the future. Um, as regards to extremists in society here, we've got to look at what we can do. Try not to alienate them. Bring them back to, to, to realise that actually there is a positive <coughs> way of dealing with these problems. There is a political method. Uh, engage with them and see what we can do to actually realise what the problems are, what's affecting them. You know, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to realise that when when there was this Palestinian and Israeli war last year in Ju June and July, uh, and it was total, almost indiscriminate bom bombing by the Israelis on the Palestinian, 2,000 Palestinian children died, how that was going to affect a Muslim person living in Britain or, or anywhere across the world, let's say, let's say. So we have to have equality and it has to be a fairness and a balance. And Israel has every right to defend itself, but the, the, they just went a little bit too far and that affects what, what happens across the world. We've got to deal with extremists, but we've got to look at our foreign policy, and we've got to support those countries in the Middle East to deal with their problems. Okay, thank you. And um, Mohammed, have your comments on that? Um, can you just repeat the question again? Repeat the question then, please. How do you think the 
UK to respond to the threat of extremism, such as ISIS and conflict in the Middle East? Right. So, um, let me just um, go into a bit more context about this. This is not something that I could just say is ABC and equals to AD. Um, reasoning is, if you look at the more of the ISIS, a lot of media attention is getting to that one. And a lot of media attention is seeming like a lot of people from the UK who are Muslims going abroad to go and fight for ISIS. That isn't the case. That's a minority. And those minorities are not standing for what they believe in because what they believe in as Islam shouldn't be describing to go abroad to go and fight again and killing dozen or mass like killing dozen people. Uh, in my opinion, I have lived in Egypt. You've probably seen what happened in Egypt. Um, you also probably have seen on the news what happened in Afghanistan, Iraq. You might have been young. I can't really remember how old was I when I was watching. I totally disagree going abroad to go and have a fight and to engage in a different war by killing more different people. The way to really be engaging in this type of issue is by, as Shobha said, is politically. By, from my opinion, by finding what the country really needs, and we need to find out why is this issue happening, and how can we help them to stop. It doesn't mean by us sending our own forces abroad, because that might actually change the whole landscape again. Um, in terms of um, extremists, um, in terms of from the UK side of the extremists, um, extremists, what is really the meaning of extremists? Because if you look at it, some of us are extremists in terms of our view. As us being 16 years old, we're extremists in what we do. We sometimes might disobey our parents because we believe it should be the other way around. That is extremist, to be honest, all right? So the definition of extremist needs to be really looked at. There's another word for describing that. I can't really remember the word that I was used to be describing it. Um, in terms of military extremists, um, for the United Kingdom, um, as the, the conservative is saying, if I get this right, you're looking into, again, potentially increasing the income that the armed forces is getting and potential, which means that they might go abroad in the future to defend other countries. You know, I said we will beef up NATO, because it's not just about ISIS, other extremism, for example, in Ukraine, that's why we need to beef up our defence systems. Defend our, okay. Beef up the defence system within the United Kingdom or defend the beef up the system where abroad? I'm happy to, to give a no, no, no. I, I, I don't think you should be interviewing at this point. It's your, <laughs> it's your views as well. So some final okay. comments from you then. All right, on this All right, the final comment is that I'm totally against going abroad to go and have a fight. Unless it means that they are coming to the United Kingdom and engage in our life. That's totally different. And then I will protect the United Kingdom. And yeah, I would actually improve the defense system around the United Kingdom, but not go abroad to go and kill other people and come. We won't be controlled for who you kill and who you don't kill. Thank you for that. Thank okay, you. thank you. And thank you for your answers there for that question. And thank you for the question. Okay. Nia, my party's got a very clear policy on this. And it's so clear that it differentiates from every party here today. And it's this. If you choose to have a Conservative majority government, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, will negotiate with Angela Merkel and the other leaders of the EU member states on the terms of the Treaty of Maastricht and indeed the Treaty of Rome. He will then come back to the United Kingdom and put it for you, Nia, to choose on whether or not the UK should stay in the EU or come out. So actually, this isn't going to be a decision for MPs to make. It will be a decision for all of us to make as a United Kingdom as to whether or not we want to stay in the EU or come out of the EU. The benefit of us having this referendum, Nia, is that we're going to be debating the issues, the advantages and disadvantages, as the people of Scotland debated the advantages and disadvantages of being within the United Kingdom. And after we've had that debate, we will have the choice, we will have the referendum. So my party is the only party that's present on this panel that will give you that choice. So it won't be for Westminster, it won't be for MPs, it will be for you to decide whether or not we stay in the EU or come out. Thank you. Amanda. Okay, I'll be short and sweet on this one. Um, sure you will. We, Labour are pro-Europe, that is the, that's the position, and I believe it's the right thing to do. It makes the UK part of one of the biggest uh, trading nations in the world, and I think that's an important thing to stay, stay part of. I had the opportunity to talk to businesses um, in the aftermath of the Scottish referendum in the north of the UK. And 
and the things they'd said to me really resonated and they were really concerned about how the Scottish referendum had an impact on their business and you, individuals wanting to invest in their businesses here in the UK if the UK were to split. They indicated that this uncertainty would be far greater if we went through the process of withdrawing or giving a referendum on the European Union. I think the European, the European Union does need to form though, and that's really important to lead on, is how does the UK get the best deal in Europe for itself, but also ensure that Europe is a combined and useful trading block that the rest of the world can trade with. It wasn't quite the question though, was it? The question was about if we pulled out, and not if we stayed in. So we've only got a couple of minutes. Okay. So. I mean, I think the, the clear thing is, is the, the concern about investment in British companies. A lot of individual companies were saying to me, if I had a European head office in anywhere in the UK, we pull out of Europe, we don't have European head offices anymore. We shift our head offices onto the continent, and I think that would be dangerous. British business doesn't want to pull out of the European Union, and I think it's really important that we don't. Okay, thank you. I, I'm a, actually by background. I, I run business. I run a business, and I used to have a business in Derby for many years. And when sorry, uh, is something I said. No, <laughs> <laughs> not this, not this time. Um, when I when I first moved to Derby, Derby was in the with the grips of recession, and the whole city was was in dire need of regeneration. And all of a sudden, Toyota decided to open in Bernersley, in Derby, on the A38. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of areas, a little over a mickle over here, just outside Derby. They started to regenerate. All the Japanese people started moving in. They started to employ a local workforce. It regenerated the whole of Derby. I, I bumped into one of these Japanese executives, and he said to, and I said to him, why did you pick Derby of all places? You could have gone anywhere in Europe. And he said, we went to Germany, and we didn't really like the German attitude. We went to Spain and they were a little bit disorganised, but we like we like we liked uh, the UK because we like the people and we like the weather, <laughs> which I thought was weird. But anyhow, so they they sent parts, not just them, uh, Nissan and so many other uh, 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 companies from outside of the EU made their European bases in the UK. That would all be put at risk, and all these companies would have to think again. At the moment, the threat of this referendum has put a lot of growth plans for those companies on hold. I know Fujitsu and some other companies are looking at, at setting up in the UK, and all those plans are on hold because of this referendum. Europe is not perfect. There's a long way to go to make it perfect. We believe that we should be part of Europe. It needs to be reformed, and we need to work harder at it and make sure that we stay part of Europe. There's a lot of people from the UK who love to go and retire to Spain, Portugal, and all parts of Europe. We should allow that to happen. We should stop, uh, stay part of the EU for business reasons and for social reasons. Okay, thank you. Mohammed? Sorry, uh, this time I'll be reading it from my phone. Or something else. Uh, I thought you were texting for a pizza or no, something. No, no, <laughs> no. I'm a young person. I use my phone to round notes. <laughs> um, so, the EU uh, project is for the benefit of the ruling class and bosses of the European. The EU structure have been almost totally discredited in 1999. Its president, Jacques Jacques and uh, and the entire European U and Commission re resigned uh, following the exposure of massive uh, fraud, mis mismanagement, and criminalism. Plus, campaigns for a greater democratic at all levels. So, if we pull, pull out of EU today, British um, people would be more free for manipulation of the super rich and uh, managing the EU. However, the same international cooperation and private equity firms will still continue to undermine democ uh, democracy in the UK. Therefore, democracy will only really increase when the country is, is in the hands of the normal people. This will only happen just by, by leaving the EU. Not will not just happen by leaving the EU. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And the final words then from you, Barry, on this question. Uh, well, I imagine there'd be a massive sigh of relief that at last this issue has been resolved and we're out. Uh, we've already been through the controlled borders argument, uh, but well, what we would have 
But could they hear these executives of big business threaten this country, a democratically elected government that they would pull out? But just before I get too excited about that, we seem to have been here before. I mean, we were here before, 15 years ago, when there was the whole argument about the euro currency. And Britain was going to dump the pound, it was going to be rubbish, uh, and we were told big business wouldn't invest in Britain unless we had this euro currency. Banks would pull out of the city of London, they wouldn't be able to do business unless we used this euro currency. Oh, the sky was going to fall in if we didn't adopt the euro currency. But here we are 15 years later, and thank goodness we're out of the straitjacket of the euro currency. And if you have any doubts about that, speak to Greeks or even uh, look at the position in uh, Spain. So how dare they threaten us? What would happen then is that we'd have a government that would start to govern in the interests of Britain and not in the interests of the European Union. And that certainty in investment, we would get more investment as small and medium business sees regulations removed and common sense policies followed, including cheaper energy. Uh, the immediate effect, of course, of not spending £55 million a day directly to the European Union is dwarfed by the total cost of misallocation of resources and etc. Uh, and if you want to read the whole thing, uh, Tim Congdon has, has uh, analysed and costed it out that it costs as much as £185 billion pounds a year, or 11% of gross national product to belong to this European Union. And with that weight removed, we would begin to develop an economy that was far more dynamic. So your simple answer there then, Barry, because I'm going to have to hold you there, is we'd be much better off. Without question. Psychologically, politically, democratically, as well as financially. Okay. Um, give our guests a round of applause.